approach some disorders of the eyelid here. I want to do a quick uh, overview of the anatomy uh, just to orient ourselves. So we'll talk about the three inflammatory disorders, two focal uh, inflammatory disorders known as Claisian and Hordeolum, and then a more diffuse inflammatory disorder called blepharitis, which has many uh, uh, causes. Uh, and then some other eyelid conditions, which are uh, a little uh, bit less tested on the USMLE, uh, the entropion, ectropion, and trichiasis. Certainly, though, uh, you will encounter these in clinical practice, especially if you work with a geriatric population. But I would say that these first three here, ecclesian, hordeolum, and blepharitis, are the most commonly tested on the USMLE out of all these things we're going to talk about. And then tumors, uh, these are tumors that occur elsewhere on the body, especially the skin, uh, but I just wanted to briefly talk about them because they do occur on the eyelid. So the external eye here, some obvious uh, points, the upper lid, lower lid, the lateral canthus, kind of hard to see, this is the right eye here, this is the nasal bridge right here, and then the medial canthus. So the lateral and medial canthus are just the, uh, the ends of the, where, the, where the eyelids come together uh, on the lateral and medial side. And this little pink spot here is called the caruncle, the lacrimal caruncle, and that's where the tears come out. So what you can't see here, uh, or inside, is the lacrimal duct, which ultimately empties into uh, the nose, and then the uh, lacrimal gland, which is on the superior and medial aspect of the orbit. Orbital septum is just the hole in the skull where the orbit sits. It's roughly, you'd have to palpate, but it's roughly this area here. Going a little deeper, you've got the orbital septum, as we just showed, the superior and inferior tarsal plates. The tarsal plates are what give the eyelid its characteristic structure, and this is just dense connective tissue. Then you have the medial and lateral palpebral ligaments, and this kind of holds the eyelid in place. Then you've got a lacrimal sac, which ultimately drains into that caruncle. you got three muscles. Uh, here, all of which are innervated by uh, the facial nerve. You have the orbicularis oculi mus muscle, which is traditionally divided up into two parts. And there's the orbital part, which is responsible for forced closure. That's uh, more on the periphery here. And then closer to the eyelids are the palpebral part. Uh, and this is responsible for blinking and blinking. Uh, the procarus muscle sits on the nasal bridge. This is responsible for drawing down your brows and that helps you make a frown or an angry face. And the frontalis muscle uh, is on the forehead, and this helps you raise your brows and wrinkle your forehead. Looking at the inner lid, if you're looking at a sagittal plane, it's pretty similar. This is the upper lid. Inner lid is pretty, or lower lid is pretty similar. Um, so you've got the tarsal plate that we talked about, that connective tissue. Within the tarsal plate, you have the meibomian glands. And the meibomian gland is a uh, sebaceous gland, and it just secretes a, a uh, lipid-rich fluid that's responsible for, uh, partially responsible for, uh, for uh, lubricating the eye. And then the Zeiss gland here, which is at the base of the eyelashes, uh, and this is more external on the eyelid. So that's the Zeiss gland. Okay, so a chalazion is a non-infectious focal swelling of the eyelid, and it's due to obstruction of a sebaceous gland. So that can be either the Zeiss gland or the meibomian gland. Most, this is the most common inflammatory lesion of the eyelid, and it's associated with various uh, diseases. So chronic blepharitis, high blood lipids, probably due to the fact that it gives you more cholesterol, more lipids that uh, can then be excreted. Uh, poor hygiene, and then various skin conditions, especially rosacea, but also acne and uh, some other skin conditions. So this typically presents as a painless swelling uh, or a mass of the eyelid. Uh, now initially when the chalazion develops, it can be painful. Uh, and if it gets large enough, it can be painful, but typically this presents as a painless swelling, uh, a painless mass. And usually the patient will seek help when the chalazion becomes either bothersome, and that's typically once it gets large enough to either cause cosmetic uh, problems where it's just unsightful, or if it gets large enough to where it's actually compressing the eye and causing visual difficulties. Likely this has been there for several weeks, or the patient won't be able to tell you how long it's been there because they lost track. If you retract the eyelid uh, that the chalazion is on, you'll see uh, conjunctival erythema. Certain symptoms like fever, eye pain, changes in vision, 
limitations in the extraocular muscles or diffuse swelling would point to alternative diagnoses. So it's typically painless and it doesn't cause changes in vision or limit the uh, motion of the eye. Um, and it's typically not a diffuse swelling, it's pretty focal. Now when I say swelling, I don't mean erythema, I mean real uh, edematous swelling. The diagnosis is clinical and generally supported by the history. If the mass is recurrent, so the patient has had a diagnosis of quote-unquote chalazion and uh, it, it hasn't uh, gone away or it's gone away and come back, you should consider doing a biopsy because it may be a tumor. The treatment is conservative. Uh, you do lid hygiene therapy, and this should be done as the initial approach. Uh, secondary infections are possible, and in that case, you should treat as hordeolum. It can be clinically difficult to distinguish a chalazion uh, if it's painful or large enough from a hordeolum, uh, but there are some rules that are useful. Like mentioned, chalazion is usually, uh, is usually painless. It tends to be smaller than a hordeolum, but if it gets, uh, or sorry, it tends to be larger than a hordeolum. Uh, but as mentioned, if it gets big enough, it can be painful. So uh, this it can be a difficult uh, differential diagnosis. So this is a chalazion here, very big. You can see uh, some surrounding erythema. Here's another chalazion here. And here's that uh, conjunctival erythema that is uh, associated with chalazions. It's very difficult to distinguish a chalazion from a hordeolum. Just by looking at it, you have to you know, ask the patient, is there pain? So just by looking at it, it can be difficult to distinguish. So another chalazion. And another one here. Okay, so lid hygiene. Remember, this was the treatment. So what is lid hygiene? So after showering, you have the patient place a warm compress over their eye for 10 to 15 minutes. And what this helps do is it melts uh, the obstructing uh, fats and lipid compound that's obstructing and causing the chalazion. And then you can use either baby shampoo or these uh, specialized uh, eyelid cleansers. And uh, what you can either do is use the eyelid cleanser uh, or you can use a uh, you can use a, a cotton applicator uh, to apply the baby shampoo or whatever you're using. And the rule is four fingers ten times. So you'll take each finger except the thumb and rub it across the uh, chalazion or the affected spot uh, ten times and then switch to the next finger. So you'd be rubbing it a total of 40 times. Or you should just do it as directed if you have uh, an eyelid cleanser uh, on the box, do it as directed. But this is typically what's done. Okay, now a hordeolum is an infectious pyogenic swelling of the eyelid due to an obstruction of the sebaceous gland. Uh, and then this is followed by localized infection. So this is different from a chalazion. A hordeolum is a pyogenic bacterial process, whereas a chalazion is a granulomatous infection. Histologically, a hordeolum is an abscess. There are similar, uh, the similar risk factors for a hordeolum uh, or for a chalazion also apply to hordeolum. Uh, so uh, the skin diseases, uh, poor hygiene, and so forth. Symptomatically, typically the patient will present with a painful mass on the eyelid, and usually it's at the base of an eyelash. A lot of times a hordeolum looks like a, like a zip, like a pimple uh, on the eye. And you can also see discharge and crusting uh, that can be present, and this will really help you distinguish it from a chalazion. There's also surrounding erythema or cellulitis, and the patient can complain of the sensation of a foreign body, excessive tearing, and light sensitivity. Uh, so the thing that's really going to help you distinguish a hordeolum from a chalazion is the pain. Diagnostically, uh, you're going to diagnose this clinically. In advanced cases, uh, there may be preceptal cellulitis, so uh, that redness around the whole eye. Uh, or you can even have a systemic infection, including fever uh, and uh, lymph involvement. And so you should palpate the preauricular lymph nodes to check for that. Treatment-wise, though, you're pretty much doing the same thing as chalazion, just with an added step here. So you'll do the lid hygiene. And if there is draining or crusting, you should add on a topical antibiotic. If there is advanced cases, 
such as if there is uh, preauricular lymphadenitis or if there's preceptal cellulitis, uh, you should also uh, give the patient an oral antibiotic. Typically, doxycycline is the treatment of choice. So here's a hordeolum. Again, it's difficult to distinguish this just by looking at it. You have to ask the patient, is there pain? So here's how it kind of looks like a, a pimple on the eye. And then this is preceptal cellulitis. So uh, the infection can spread. And this, this patient, uh, if they have a horiolum along with the preceptal cellulitis, then you're going to need to uh, give them oral antibiotics. Okay, blepharitis is diffuse inflammation of the eyelid. So whereas the calasian and hordeolum were, uh, were uh, focal, this is diffuse. This goes across the entire eyelid. And this can be due to various causes, and it's wide, wide, wide range of causes. Allergic, chemical, infectious, dermatologic, ocular, and autoimmune. This is relatively common, and in most cases, it's not contagious. So some of the allergic causes can be drug reactions, allergic dermatitis, uh, Stephen Johnson syndrome. Uh, the ones I have in bold here are some of the more common causes. So a drug reaction is a relatively common cause. Uh, chemical causes include smoke or fume exposure, uh, smog or eye drops, especially uh, some of the eye drops that don't have preservatives. If they're uh, prescribed eye drops and they sit out too long, uh, that can be a precipitating factor. The infectious causes, most commonly it's Staph aureus, but you can also have uh, a D folliculorum, that's Dermidex folliculorum, and that is a uh, parasite, uh, uh, Phytoriasis, uh, herpes zoster virus, and varicella zoster, vi varicella zoster virus are other causes. Dermatologically, rosacea is uh, a common cause. You can probably see a theme here with that. Seborrheic dermatitis is another common cause, but it's a little bit less common than rosacea. Meibomian gland dysfunction and molluscum contagiosum. Ocular, ocular uh, causes include dry eye syndrome, uh, calasian, trichiasis, conjunctivitis, and keratitis. Autoimmune causes are Sjogren syndrome, and this can be actually a presenting symptom of Sjogren's symptom, uh, syndrome and uh, SLE. So typically the patient here will present with itchy and irritated eyes. There will be erythema of the eyelid and the surrounding skin. And if you retract the eyelid, you'll also see palpebral uh, conjunctivitis. A lot of times the patient will also complain of excessive lacrimation. Some other symptoms that you can see, uh, for instance, in staphylococcal blepharitis, uh, there will often be a discharge that causes the eyelids to stick together. A lot of times you'll also see a crust, which is just the discharge dried up. And this tends to be more anterior, more on the outer part of the eyelid than in the inner part of the eyelid. Seborrheic blepharitis, caused from seborrheic dermatitis, often features these characteristic greasy flakes or scales along the base of the eyelashes. And uh, if the patient has seborrheic dermatitis, Generally, you'll see skin abnormalities elsewhere, particularly the scalp and along the nose. This is a chronic disease, and so the patient will typically uh, have chronic blepharitis in addition to their chronic uh, dermatitis caused from the seborrheic dermatitis. And this also is more on the anterior side. The meibomian blepharitis, this is due to uh, meibomian dysfunction. And a lot of times what you'll see with this, if you look really closely, is puckered or clogged meibomian orifices. And I'll show you a picture of that. This is more on the posterior, the inner part of the eyelid. Ulcerative blepharitis can be uh, from, it's usually due to the infectious causes, so staph, varicella zoster, uh, and this is uh, characterized by hard crusts that bleed when they're removed. As far as diagnosis, this is again a clinical diagnosis, but it can be aided with slip lamp examination if you're uh, unsure of the diagnosis. So, uh, if, there's, if the symptoms are more anterior, uh, then it's probably bacterial or seborrheic. If they're more posterior, uh, posterior then it's probably meibomian gland dysfunction. Uh, but they tend to present with similar symptoms. So eyelid irritation, red eye, dry eye. So here's blepharitis here. You can see uh, it's hard to tell what exactly the cause is just by looking at it, but you can kind of see some of that scaling here, and that may be uh, due to uh, the um, uh, staphylococcus. 
And then you can also see what m might be bleeding here. And that would be uh, the ulcerations. So here's the meibomian glands. So if you just look at the, uh, the inner part of the eyelid, uh, you should see the meibomian glands. Uh, generally, they're uh, pretty inconspicuous, but if they're clogged, you'll see these. Uh, they're a little bit more obvious. So here you can see what looks like a discharge. So this is probably staph. So the treatment approach is lid hygiene as well as an antibiotic ointment. So that's the initial treatment of choice. That's what you'll send the patient out with. Uh, the antibiotic is topical and you'll use either erythromycin or sulfacetamide. In cases where there's conjunctival or corneal symptoms, so a really red eye, then uh, you may want to substitute the antibiotic ointment with a combination antibiotic and corticosteroid ointment and that can help uh, alleviate the symptoms a little bit quicker. And so an example of that would be sulfacetamide with prednisolone. Uh, refractory cases you can uh, treat with tetracycline or doxycycline orally. If, you're, if it's suspicious for defolicularum, uh, you can use ivermectin. And generally, you'd be suspicious if multiple therapies have failed. So you've tried the lid hygiene antibiotic ointment, that's failed. You've tried the PO tetracycline, that's failed. Then you can try using ivermectin. And uh, by that point, usually a referral to dermatology can be desirable because they're, they have a little bit more knowledge in treating this stuff. As far as uh, the uh, uh, dry eyes, you definitely give them artificial tears. That will help with that. And then treatment of any underlying predisposition. So if they have rosacea, there's treatments for that. If they have lupus, there's treatments for that and so forth. Other eyelid conditions uh, include ectropion. So this is an abnormality of the lower eyelid in which it turns outward. It, it can be congenital. So they, you see it in little kids. Uh, but often it's... Most commonly, it's acquired uh, because of weakening of the orbicularis oculi muscle, and that kind of uh, uh, it kind of uh, weakens the shape of the eyelid. Uh, because not only is it the tarsal plate that gives the eyelid its shape, but it's also the tone of the muscle. And so, uh, just with normal aging and weakening of the orbicularis oculi muscle, you can get uh, droopiness of, of the uh, eyelid, and that's an ectropion, where it turns out uh, outward. Typically, this is asymptomatic, but if there are symptoms, usually it's going to be excessive tearing. Why is that? Not because you're making more tears, it's because the eyelid cannot hold the tears because it's turned out. And so the tears are just going to, uh, are just going to drip right out of the eyelid. Uh, so it can't hold its normal volume. If this becomes problematic enough, uh, you can uh, repair this surgically. Entropion is just the opposite. So this is an abnormality of the eyelid. It could be upper or lower uh, in which it turns inward. And the, uh, this can be congenital or due to aging. Uh, it can also be secondary to trachoma infection, but you're not going to see this in the U.S. It's very rare in the U.S., more so seen in North Africa and South Asia. Uh, it can irritate the eye because with entropion, since it's turning in, it's also turning the eyelashes in, and the eyelashes, when they rub up against the orbit, uh, can cause uh, inflammation. And this is also surgically repaired. Trichiasis is a misdirection of one or several eyelashes causing contact with the globe, similar to what causes the symptoms in entropion, and then subsequently causes irritation. And so some of the causes can include uh, scarring of the posterior lamella, uh, trachoma, epiblepharon, which is an abnormal horizontal fold of the eyelash, and dystrichiasis. Uh, the patient will usually complain of eye irritation, foreign body sensation, and if you look at the eye, uh, you'll be able to see that the eyelash, uh, either one or several eyelashes, will be directed uh, in an abnormal direction. And I'll show you a picture of that. Uh, this is also surgically repaired. So here's ectropion. So you can see that this eyelash or this eye, uh, eyelid is directed outward. And you can imagine when you're making tears, since it's directed outward like this, the tears are just going to flow right out. Here's another one. 
Okay, and I had to, I had to put this in, so dogs can get it too, especially basset hounds. So this is like the typical puppy eye. Okay, the end trophy uh, is uh, going inward, and uh, what's really obvious here is the eyelashes that are uh, pushed up against the orbit, and you can see some irritation. The conjunctiva. And here's another one. And then trachiasis looks just like the entropian, where you get the eyelashes being pushed up against the orbit, but there's some eyelashes that are pointing the normal way and some eyelashes that are pointing in. And so it's not a disorder of the uh, eyelid, it's uh, a disorder of the eyelashes being directed in an abnormal direction. Here's another one. So some of the tumors that involve the eyelid, by far the most common tumor, if you see a mass on the eyelid and uh, it's a tumor, uh, would be a basal cell carcinoma. And a majority of them occur on the lower eyelid. This makes up 85% of tumors that involve the eyelid. Uh, the way that you would uh, treat this is with a surgical excision, ensuring clear margins. Generally, that's not difficult to do. Uh, so this, uh, you should suspect a tumor in cases where uh, the patient has risk factors for the tumor, but also where you remove the mass and it's came back. Squamous cell carcinoma makes up about 5% of eyelid tumors. It appears similar to other squamous cell skin cancers, uh, but in some cases it can lack that distinctive central crater that you see in squamous cell cancer cancers, and that's known as a keratoacanthoma. And uh, with any squamous cell carcinoma, the patients will uh, typically have a history of excess sun exposure uh, or possibly even a history of actinic keratosis. Surgical excision here is uh, done as well with clear margins. It's a little bit more difficult to do. This, uh, the squamous cell carcinoma doesn't have as, uh, as nicely defined margins as the basal cell carcinoma. And so usually these patients will need further treatment. Sebaceous gland carcinoma makes up about 5% of the eyelid tumors as well, and these, as you can imagine, originate from meibomian and or Zeiss glands. It's often mistakenly diagnosed as a chalazion, but it wouldn't spawn to treatment for a and the majority occur on the upper eyelid. Uh, again, here you're going to do surgical excision with clear margins. All patients who have a confirmed sebaceous gland carcinoma should be imaged and worked up for something called Muir-Torre syndrome. Uh, so in addition to doing the imaging, you'll also want to do a colonoscopy to look for uh, uh, bowel cancer. And also a, on women, you'll want to, do, uh, you'll, you'll want to uh, look at the cervix um, because those are some of the more common cancers with this syndrome. Uh, Muir-Torre syndrome is an autosomal dominant disease predisposing the patient to sebaceous gland tumors. And then... Uh, some other rare eyelid tumors include melanoma, which obviously isn't very rare on the skin, but it is rare on the eyelid, and Merkel cell tumors, which is a nerve 